Coming up on this special edition of the R Podcast, we wrap up our coverage of the Shiny Developer Conference by speaking with members of the R Studio team. In part one, we have a panel discussion with JJ Allaire, Jeff Allen, and Hadley Wickham about the conference and future directions of the R Studio IDE. And in part two, I have an extended conversation with Joe Chang, creator of Shiny, about how about the origins of Shiny and his perspective on the future direction going forward. So I hope you're ready for this exciting edition of the R Podcast. This is episode 18. Are you ready? This is episode 18 of the R Podcast. My name is Eric, and I'm excited to bring this episode to you because this is kind of putting a, a wrap on my coverage of the Shiny Developer Conference, but we're going out with a bang, as they say. Um, on the last day of the conference, I had a, the pleasure of being able to sit down with members of the R Studio team just as things kind of wrapped up. And I was able to be fortunate enough to chat with uh, J.J. O'Leary, Jeff Allen, and yes, Hadley Wickham um, in a nice entertaining discussion uh, about their, in, their um, opinion of the conference and you know where, where things are headed in terms of the R Studio and IDE. And then in part two of, of this episode, you're also going to hear from the creator Shiny himself, Joe Chang. Um, we had an extended conversation just about how Shiny was originally developed, kind of what was the inspiration for it, um, some of his perspective on the key features that were outlined in the conference, and his thoughts on kind of extensions and future directions uh, going forward. Um, I will say just before we get to those interviews, just kind of share my thoughts on the conference itself. Um, First, I think um, from my perspective, it was the first um, R conference I've ever attended in person. And I think this was kind of the perfect um, audience or setting for someone like me because it wasn't too big. So there wasn't like multiple tracks. We were all kind of looking at the same material together. But I think the, the size of it really um, facilitated a lot of interactive discussions, both with you know, the R Studio team and the instructors and just among each other during the breaks. It just, I was able to kind of make some connections and, and meet new uh, members of the community. And then as you've seen in the past couple of episodes, I was able to have some great conversations with um, two of the members I've been really uh, following closely, uh, Dean Atelli and uh, Vincent Nice about their, their work with Shiny. And it's been really good to get to know them. And I'm Hopefully, I'm able to collaborate with them in the future on, you know, things with Shiny or R in general. Um, but this episode was definitely, um, I'm very excited to bring this to you. And then um, I think that's enough of me rambling. I'm going to play each of these uh, interviews in, 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 in sequence back to back. So without further ado, let's dive into our main topics for today. Our interview with members of the R Studio team. All right, everybody. Um, this is an exciting day for all of us that's attended the Shiny Developer Conference, although it's somewhat bittersweet. We have just ended the full conference itself. Um, I know I'm speaking for myself. But I think a lot of the attendees, this has been a absolutely excellent experience um, for a lot of us it was our first art conference that we've attended um, but without further further ado i am joined by members of the r studio team uh, right right next to me so i'm gonna kind of go one by one and have them introduce themselves and their role in the company so first uh, JJ. yeah hi i'm i'm jj Allaire. i'm the original developer of uh, the r studio ide and um, founder of the company I'm Hadley Wickham, the chief scientist and author of lots of R packages. 
Uh, I'm Jeff Allen. I'm a software engineer. I work on uh, Shiny Server. All right. Well, thanks so much, guys, for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, I'm going to start off with now that we've wrapped the conference, um, have there been any surprises in terms of how the our, our audience has received the, the, received the material? Was there any insights to kind of the questions that have been asked in terms of future directions for, say, this conference going forward or even for Shiny in general? So I'll just let whoever wants to talk first. I guess I've been really surprised by just like how far people have pushed Shiny. Like that, I think the talk. I mean, I you know I sort of seen preview stuff of all the internal R Studio things already. So to me, like the exciting thing was seeing what our customers have been doing, and like and Shiny users have been doing to make really awesome apps and really pushing the boundaries in pretty incredible ways. Yeah, there seems to be quite quite a bit of demand for things to push Shiny farther. And so we saw, you know, we delivered some, but then like Shiny JS and people are doing all kinds of wonderful things with JavaScript. And so it was great to see that. And, I, and we sort of feel like we're just not quite ahead of the curve there. Like we need to keep up with all the things that people want to do. Right, right. Um, I know I was personally fascinated with, of course, the material that your team has presented, but also the lightning talks and the user talks where... I'm just seeing so many different uses that I know me personally want to take in and, and try out with. Um, so maybe getting to another kind of stepping back a bit, what was the kind of motivation for saying, okay, we've had Shiny for a couple of years now, let's go ahead and do a dedicated conference, just the Shiny, it's, uh, the Shiny Developer Conference. Kind of what was the motivation for forming that? Um, I think um, we, we, we have a lot of... Uh, communication with people on like the shiny discuss list we have a lot of ad hoc side conversations that happen at user groups but we really felt like um, we wanted to, to to get a critical mass of feedback and also to kind of force us to articulate a lot of the things that were important about shiny that like joe really was motivated he wanted people to understand reactivity really well and he didn't feel like he could do that in under four hours you know and there was a bunch of other things that he felt like he wanted to share and that we had to share and so that was that was kind of where it came from Cool. And uh, this question maybe more for you, Hadley. Um, you did a, a great talk about using Shiny gadgets and embedding that in your pipeline for our studio. I know you've been so focused on kind of the whole data analysis pipeline recently of importing data, processing with things like dplyr and tidyr, and then of course visualizing, which you've obviously done quite a bit. Um, where do you see in terms of kind of the interactive capabilities of an analysis and how Shiny is going to play a role, especially with the new features going ahead and making analysis easier for, for our users? Yeah, I think there's just a lot we'll still to do in terms of decreasing the feedback loop so that your, your iteration time is even faster. And I think it, it's just... It, no, I feel like there's a lot of work ahead of me in terms of making um, gadgets and add-ons so you can explore your data even more quickly so you can kind of prototype your dplyr expressions and get feedback like in hundreds of milliseconds. So as you type, you're seeing that feedback. So you can quick as quickly as possible get the feedback. You never end up sort of running the a code that doesn't work because you're constantly seeing what the results are going to be as you type. And I think that's going to be a big... Um, a big time saver and then thinking about you know how is that good, is that going to be an add-in or does it need to be integrated more deeply into our studio and just that 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 right. preview so right. like just do it so you can the quicker you can iterate the better it's really yes. really powerful and there's just so much we can do with the integration of javascript and html widgets and Right, yeah. right. I mean, frankly, I personally don't know a lot about JavaScript or CSS or things like that. So the fact that it's some of it's abstracted away, but I can see that if I take the time to invest a little bit, there is so much potential to additional things yeah. we can do as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so obviously, as, as Hadley mentioned, the RStudio ID has been a huge revolution in how we develop our code. Um, I know obviously a lot of great features are in at this point, but um, in term, when we look at the rest of 2016, what are some of the key maybe new features or ideas that you yeah. want to explore personally yeah. with the development? We got a few things that uh, I think foremost of which is uh, we want to add kind of a notebook mode to the, the R Markdown editor okay. so that, that when you're working on an R Markdown document, you can, you can sort of work in a notebook mode where output is in line. 
uh, you can kind of use it as a like a literate rebel. Um, so that's where we're working, we're spending a lot of time on that. We're very excited about that. Um, we're we've actually we're doing a bunch of work now to um, to kind of create a front end for some of Hadley's data import packages that he wrote last year. So sort of an interactive front end where you get the file and it shows you, you know, what the data is going to look like, what the types are. You can tweak them around. You can change the settings, um, things like that. Sort of to Hadley's point about getting immediate feedback. You can see what the import is going to be. You can tweak it, you know, and then boom, and it gives you the code. Um, and then uh, we're going to do some work with the, you saw presented at the package, the ProfViz package. Yes. So we're going to do some work to integrate that uh, into the IDE, integrate profiling more more deeply into the IDE. Right, right. And then I think the last thing, this isn't, um, this. I think there are implications for the IDE in this, but it's a broader initiative, is we want to we want to get a lot better at teaching R and helping other people teach R. And I, just it's just, the, it's, there's the base R. Um, but then it's also when, if I have an R package and I want to show people how to use it, how can I create something that's really informative, interactive, effective at teaching, makes people effective at learning. Right. So there will be some things that we do in the IDE for that, but then that's kind of a broader initiative. Right, so. right. And that's, that's been a subject close to me personally where, at, where I work. I've done some internal R trainings and what R Studio brings in terms of a standardized environment, for especially the server edition, is absolutely critical. Um, but I know anything that you guys can do to even make that jump a little easier, especially um, for those that come from other statistical packages. Um, there's a certain one with three letters that comes yeah. to mind. Um, but anything, I mean, obviously, have we what you've done with Haven to help even just get the data into R to begin with when we don't have the privilege of converting it in another way. That is such a, a critical thing. So, yeah, the R Studio ID, I definitely am, am a big fan of that. Um, and also, I guess um, now that we've you've had obviously the shiny point one three release, um, given what we've heard in the conference, um, what do you think are kind of the next things for shiny itself going forward? I, I maybe Hadley has a better idea. I have not spoken to Joe, or maybe Jeff has a better idea. Um, I don't know what his because he delivered or the, the team delivered such a huge payload of things for this conference. Uh, they might want to catch. All I know is they might that want to catch the breath for a little. It's going to involve monads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you'll have to ask Joe. I sure, think he's absolutely. he's supposed to. You're going to get together with him. I think. I know. Soon. One of the things that we've been working on, and I talked briefly about this on the server side, but also within Shiny, um, is just like improving the robustness of the connections, um, right. and so uh, ensuring that the user experience, especially. So within Shiny, there's there's an improvement that we can make on uh, applications like dashboards where it really doesn't matter if you've been disconnected for 12 hours. Like we can just reconnect you and you don't need to know that you were ever disconnected. Right, um, right. So improving some experiences like that, I think. Yeah, yeah, because I know a lot of the, the people where I work, they're not exactly, you know, software developers by trade. We're all basically statisticians learning how to put our, our analyses into some interactive way. So any way to kind of mask any technical hiccups along the way where then if some grays out or sometimes out, they're going to call our IT group and be like, what, yeah. what's wrong with our service? Where it's not really anything that yeah. wrong. It's just, you know, the way things are. But yeah, yeah I'll, I'll definitely be interested in seeing those improvements yeah, going forward. The hope forward. is that you'll see a lot fewer of those moving forward. So. Yes, I, exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, so this is, this has been great to talk with you guys. I guess I'll give you guys a chance to either um, give some plugs of certain things going forward or what do you want our listeners to kind of stay tuned for from our studio going uh, forward? I will say uh, there's a new release of our studio coming out uh, in early February. Mm -hmm. So I hope everybody downloads that. There's a preview uh, version of it available now. So that's uh, definitely wor worth a look. And I would say... Um, Take a look at, you can Google for RStudio add-ins. We have documentation on how to create add-ins. And, and really, you can write add-ins that are just things that like work in the editor. So you could do like create a refactoring tool that has no user interface. So those are interesting. But I think the shiny gadget-based add-ins will be the most interesting one. So I hope people take a look at that and think about uh, how it might make them and the people they work with more effective, to Hadley's point. And um, I, I hope we can see some really, really lights out stuff there. So that's... Very good. Very good. Yeah. And I, I think we'll probably see some stuff for kind of improved, making it easy to generate code too, because one of the things you often want to do in these in these add-ins is like express something that's hard to express in code, but you want to capture it in your code so that you can reproduce it the next time you run the script. So I, I think Joe and I have talked a little bit about maybe we need some better tools to help people like generate code that then could get saved back into the, the IDE. 
Yeah, I think that's going to be great from a reproducibility standpoint, especially for industries where that's such a critical critical item. Yep. Excellent. Well, um, obviously, I want you guys to enjoy the remainder of the conference, but thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk with me. I know our listeners are going to be really excited to see the materials of this going forward. And obviously, I think given the huge demand to get on this uh, invitation list that next year you're going to have a, a really yeah. large turnout. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. it's a good All problem right. to have. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so a series about Shiny, and in particular this series about the Shiny Developer Conference, frankly would not be complete without having a chat with um, the architect or the creator of Shiny itself. So with that said, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Joe Chang, uh, CTO of our studio, um, to the R Podcast. So Joe, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Eric. All right, so I do have a lot of questions for you, especially about the conference, but I think for our listeners that may have heard, obviously, about about you through your work with Shiny, maybe you could tell our listeners a bit about your background and all how you got started with using R, and in particular, R Studio. Sure. Um, before I started working with R, uh, I was a software engineer. Uh, I've been a software engineer ever since college, and... Um, <clears throat> Mostly, I'd worked at startups in the Boston area, just one startup after another. And um, a couple of them were founded by J.J. Allaire, uh, who is the founder of our studio, and that's how I got to know him. And um, at the time that he started our studio, um, I was at Microsoft. I had um, worked at a, a, a J.J. startup that had been acquired by Microsoft, and, um, and I was still there, and he had already left. And uh, he came to me having discovered R, I, I guess this was about 2008, late 2008 or early 2009. And, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't quite as obvious then as it is now, the impact that R would have. Uh, and I certainly didn't know anything about statistics or why statistics <laughs> were interesting at all, honestly. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I basically... Um, trusted JJ that this was going to be um, an interesting piece of software in the future. And um, and also, to be honest, um, just getting the chance to work with JJ um, is not something that I would uh, turn down lightly. And um, and the, the product that he had in mind, the RStudio IDE, sounded so interesting. Just the idea of building an IDE on the web, those things were all just so interesting to me that um, that I felt like I had to, to take that um, that offer. Uh, and, and really, it it has been over the last few years working at our studio that obviously I've really come to appreciate R as a language and um, statistics and data science as, uh, you know, just fascinating fields. Um, and sure. I'm really glad I got the opportunity um, that I did. Yeah, we're, we're certainly glad that you're working on a lot of these innovative efforts. Um, um, so I'll just give you a, a, a little background. I've been using R for now. It's about 11 or 12 years now. And I will say that before our studio, like the IDE came along, it was just kind of this hodgepodge of mishmash IDE wannabes that I went back and forth, but nothing did like everything I wanted. There were some that did some things well, some that did other things well, but it wasn't until our studio came along that I felt like somebody finally got it right for all the pieces that we want, whether it's just being able to run code and see it clearly in the console, be able to see what the heck is in my workspace because gosh knows how many objects we will create along in a session and what packages we have available. So thank goodness you guys came along because it was, I mean, I don't want to discount the work from others, but there was really nothing that, that had such a focus that our studio had. So I'm definitely a, on behalf of others, especially the people I work with, we really appreciate our studio itself. Um, so obviously you worked on the IDE quite a bit, but maybe you could tell our listeners what um, the inspiration was in terms of finally uh, creating this um, innovative package called Shiny. Yeah, uh, it was actually during the very early days of uh, beta testing the, uh, the IDE. In those days, we weren't even talking about it being a desktop product. It was only going to be a server product. And uh, we had 
gone to uh, McAllister College, which is where uh, JJ um, went to school. And uh, Professor Danny Kaplan there was our very first beta tester, I believe. And he um, very bravely tested our studio with, uh, you know, an, an entire statistics class. Um, and as uh, in our first conversation with Danny in person, JJ said that we had kind of combined the web and R, and we meant you have an IDE for R in the web now. And what he heard was, oh, great, I can build little applications using R to, to um, illustrate um, statistical ideas visually uh, and interactively. Oh, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I've been wanting. And we were like, oh, no, no, uh, we're, we're talking about this other thing. And, uh, and Danny, you know, really, really understood about our studio. He understood the vision. He got it right away. But he said, and this other thing, too, if you get around to it, that'd be amazing. And um, JJ and I talked about it uh, during that visit. And what I, what I said to JJ was, we should do that someday, but only uh, if we know how to do it well. So both of us had built web frameworks before. Um, there, there was a really obvious path to, to, to take some of the existing art for other programming languages and just make a straight port um, or, or, you know, just a similar model view controller style web framework for R, but then you're asking R users not only to learn how to write R, R code, but now they also need to become web developers. Uh, so to both of us, it was pretty clear that that was a total non-starter. Um, and in particular for me, um, if you make very interactive, uh, I guess what we call single page applications now, there's a lot of just inherently very complicated code that you have to write um, invo involving a lot of callbacks. Uh, so I just kind of thought to myself, we, we don't want to inflict that on our users, but if we could come up with some kind of a tidy syntax for expressing applications um, that we, you know, wouldn't be too much of a cognitive burden on people, then absolutely, that sounds like a great idea. And, um, and it was years later um, that uh, we were at another conference and uh, somebody else um, I, I want to say it was Ian Fellows, uh, who is the guy behind, I want to say Deducer. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he, I believe it was he and I were talking over lunch uh, and, and just talking about this general idea of GUIs and R and, you know, what what is what is better in code and what things are better as interactive applications. And we just talked about this idea of building uh, a web framework that that anyone could could uh who was an R user would be able to successfully build applications with. And uh, I was talking about it as some distant, far off thing. And he, he said to me, uh, somebody should really do that. And uh, probably it should be you. Um, so, uh, or, or you guys, you know, meaning our studio. Uh, so, so that kind of re rebooted the idea in my mind. And it was, um, I think later that year, um, at the UseR conference in 2012, I believe, at Vanderbilt, when um, it was the final day of the conference, and I woke up in the morning in my bed, and when I opened my eyes, um, the first thought that popped into my head, my first conscious thought was um, reactivity, um, a, a concept that I discovered recently from Meteor, uh, a JavaScript framework. If you combined reactivity on a server side with um, an easy to express um, UI. Uh, at the time I was thinking that you'd write HTML with annotations, um, but with, with some easy to, to use UI builder, that's it. Those are the two things you need. And boom, you have the ability to write uh, what we now call shiny apps. Uh, so that as soon as that picture appeared in my head, I just had a feeling like we have to build this. So I, I you know, fired up notepad or whatever and just sketched out what that code would look like what a what an app in this framework would look like and i ran downstairs and i found jj and i said look at this you know <laughs> look <laughs> like what do you think and he took one look and was like yes that is what you're working on full time from now on um and that that was it uh that really was uh the genesis like that 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 combination of those two ideas and at the time, it was very speculative uh, how far we could take this model. And that's one of the, thing the things that's been 
uh, the biggest pleasures for me about this this whole journey with Shiny over the last um, you know three and a half years has been how that initial combination of easy to express UI and reactive programming um, we have not found the bottom of that rabbit hole yet. We just keep going, and every time we think now we've explored everything that we can do with this, there's just a whole other vista that opens up, uh, including last week. So, exactly, uh, including yeah. yesterday. Actually, there's stuff that I'm not ready to talk about yet, but uh, we'll be talking about soon. That really, you know, kind of take uh, reactivity in yet another direction. So it, it, it's, it is really exciting, and, it, and it's it's just a whole lot of fun to work on. Awesome. Well, that's a teaser for in the future then. Um, <laughs> Sorry about so, that. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I always, I'm always uh, plugged into what you guys are announcing. Um, so, I guess since Shiny, of course, was first formed, like you said, three and a half years ago, as as users were starting to get to play with it a bit, and obviously um, there were some early adopters. Um, one of which I've talked with on a previous episode at the at the Shiny conference of uh, Vincent Nice, of course, who makes Radiant. Um, did you notice like any patterns as users starting to get into Shiny of like what were some of the parts that they understood pretty well from the beginning or maybe some parts that or some concepts that they were having trouble understanding that, you know, you kind of sense that, oh, we're going to have to put more guidance or more tutorials around certain parts of Shiny. Did you notice any of those points? Um, you know, I think it was... It's hard to say because from the beginning, the reception has been so great from the community that we have such a diversity of people um, who, are, who are trying out Shiny and, and, and building really significant things on Shiny. So on the one hand, there are people like uh, Simon Urbanek, um, who's in our core and you know, one, of, one of the uh, elite uh, programmers in the, in the R community. Um, I saw him at a conference and we were uh, talking about reactive programming and he was really uh, fascinated by the idea. And, you know, before I even finished my demo, I feel like he had internalized a lot of these really deep concepts. Um, and other people who, you know, were early adopters of Shiny and I feel like still haven't really internalized the concepts. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not their fault, but it is a quite unnatural uh, style of programming. So so I think that Shiny users are a very diverse bunch and, and we're sort of all over the map. So I'm, I'm constantly surprised at um, how much people do understand, especially at this conference, I think um, all of us at our studio were surprised by how sophisticated the, the average user was at the conference. Um, but at the same time, we still get new questions in every day on the Shiny Discuss list that could be answered, you know, with... Um, some time in the tutorial. Um, so I, I think it's really either way. And um, that's been one of the things that's been interesting to me is is um, how how much education is needed for everyone to get something. Um, and, and, you know, topic after topic that I thought we had, you know, we were done with the feature, we were done documenting it. And, and then we constantly get questions. So we realize, oh, no, we did not quite explain that well enough. And we have to go at it again. So right right well it's kind of like r itself there it's such a you know while it's marketed or it's been pushed as statisticians now we have so many others getting into it as well and from all sorts of different fields so we're we're experiencing this in different pockets um so i think we'll just kind of dovetail into the conference itself now i i was i was there as well and obviously i think it was you could re you really showed how well you guys prepared for it. I thought everything was logically laid out in terms of the topics, and I think it's no no accident that the very first thing that we dive deep into was reactivity because it's such a fundamental piece of shiny. Um, so just in the prep work of the conference itself, what what kind of first of all it must have taken a lot of work to prepare for, but what kind of steps did you guys take to get ready for for such an innovative conference to happen? Yeah, um, I I think for us the there was a surprising amount of time that we spent um, trying to convince ourselves that we could pull off a conference in the first place, um, that that a conference was desirable and needed, and that we could do it successfully. Um, and I think once we made that decision, then the list of topics came together relatively easily. Um, and I think a number of the presenters have told me it was relatively easy for them to come up with their presentations. Um, but I got to tell you, I really suffered, uh, making that reactivity presentation. Um, 
that was one of the hardest things that I've um, had to do, uh, partially because my strength is writing code. Um, you know, anytime, either written communications or presentations, um, I really have a hard time uh, stopping. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? I think a lot of us share that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for for this reactivity in particular, I wanted so badly, so badly for it to go well. And um, the, the topics are so abstract and they could be approached in so many different ways. And I mean, I've been thinking about reactivity nonstop for you know several years now. So I also have to put myself back into the place of someone who's just kind of been through the tutorial. So for all these reasons, uh, it was incredibly challenging. And I, I spent a lot of time um, writing and rewriting. And, and I mean, for a while there, every week I was just throwing the entire thing out and starting over with a completely new approach. And, um, you know, I got towards the end and I had, I don't know, 40 slides put together or something. And then I was reading an article uh, or a blog post or something where someone was saying the like complete worst way to teach someone something is to talk at them about it and particularly for technical topics. So <laughs> right, I was like, all right, right, I better start over and make it based on, you know, completely on exercises. So, um, you know, I think if the, if the, if the talk had been, if the conference had been one week later, maybe I would have thrown out the, you know, presentation one more time and you would have heard something totally different and who knows how it would have gone. But I'm really happy that it was received as well as it, as it was. It seemed like most people really got the point and, uh, and enjoyed it. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I will acknowledge that I, I did feel more like a novice compared to a lot of the other attendees. But with that said, I felt like after your presentation, a lot of things finally started to click as to why things work the way they do. Like I've been through the tutorials, I've been through the articles, I've done at least, you know, five or six internal apps at my company and, and some stuff on the side. But I always felt like I was kind of winging it in terms of crossing my fingers that this reactive object is going to map correctly to this output and kind of hope for the best. But now you, you really compared and contrast nicely the concept of what's reactive and what we observed and the concept of side effects. And I think the exercise format is like the only real way to instill that and kind of make others practice that. And when I've given our trainings internally in the past, I've been guilty of, like you said earlier, talking to them, but not really prodding them into trying something. So I think with Shiny as well as some other R concepts, you really almost have to make your audience practice this and make sure that they have the opportunity to ask questions on why things work and not just, like I said, cross their fingers and be like, oh, I got it right this time, okay, yay. But actually understand not to say theory behind it, but there is a methodology behind it. And reactivity, I think, is a new concept to a lot of our users. So I think just diving into those details is extremely helpful, especially for me. So yeah, absolutely. thanks for putting all that effort into it. And it was, like you said, it, that's probably one of the hardest things to prepare for, for sure. Um, yeah. And let, let me add one thing to that. Um, I, I, uh, uh, what you said about how, how you felt using... Um, shiny and reactivity before you really understood uh, some of those things. Um, so on the one hand, shiny is designed so that even if you're pretty new at it and you haven't really had time to sit down and study the materials that you can kind of wing your way through it, you know, like that, that that's what it was. That was part of um, our goal in designing the framework the way the way it's designed uh, is that you don't need to internalize the concepts before you start using it. But it's really important to me, and it always has been, that when you when you explore deeper with Shiny, when you when you do take the time to dig around a little bit and and learn a little more deeply about some of these fundamental uh, concepts, that you find that what's underneath is really nice, you know. <laughs> um, right, that, right. That, That's pretty elegant. I yeah, must say. yeah. That that reactivity. It's almost like the deeper you go into it, the more elegant it becomes. And, uh, and for the UI, there's something similar in that, you know, at, at first it seems like you're dealing with these kind of magic function calls that make a sidebar and, and, you know, drop a select input into it. And then when you get a little bit more into it, you realize, oh, these things are just generating HTML. Yes. Um, and then yes. when you look at how those particular functions are implemented, you realize that, oh, it's, it's not only just HTML, but the way you express HTML in Shiny is extremely elegant and, um, you know, very simple. And and all of these 
you know, bootstrappy type things that, that we're doing in the UI, they're incredibly small chunks of HTML generating code that you also can go and do yourself either in your apps or in packages or in modules. It all composes, you can, you can compute on these HTML objects. And um, what, what I have long hoped was that the end result of having the system where you can start out and even if things don't make sense, you can be a little bit productive. Um, but the deeper you dive in, um, and the more effort you put into it, the more you're rewarded. Is that um, uh, th- there was a line from um, there's a blogger named Kathy Sierra. Uh, Kathy Sierra. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Um, and yeah, she, I think I've read her work before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and her her blog is all about making products that make users passionately loyal to them. And one of the main things that I took away from her writings is that some products that are really well designed, you use them and you think, wow, this product kicks ass, you know, and that's great. Um, Other ones, you use them and they take a little more effort and you have to um, really invest. But when you do, you're you're rewarded. And what you feel when you come away from those experiences, wow, I kick ass. And that is the, um, that has long been my hope that Shiny uh, engenders that kind of feelings in people that they, they put in this effort and they're not just happy with the result that they get, but they're also happy uh, with how their thinking has been able to change and, uh, you know, that they've been able to understand these really elegant concepts. And that also is something that I was really encouraged by at the conference. Uh, people seemed to not only get those reactivity examples, but they really enjoyed it. Uh, a number of people told me that they went home that night and did the rest of the examples from the uh, slides, even though I didn't get right, to them. Right, right. <laughs> um, and that's great. You know, I, I that's the way I feel when I discover something new about reactivity. And, uh, and I'm glad that at least uh, some other people feel that way as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. And, and when I was um, waiting for my flights on Monday, I pulled out the laptop, I went through, I've completed all but the last exercise, <laughs> which I believe you acknowledge is a bit diabolical. The, the last remember. one is hard. Yeah, it's, it's yeah hard. so I, I'm going to need some more time with that. But I remember when I got exercise six, I was like, oh, man, I'm really on the right track. Here. This <laughs> stuff's actually working in my head. So I'm good. So yeah, that, that was awesome that you gave me those kind of homework if you will the 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 practice of that um great so i think you know with the conference happening it was this great blend of not only your team discussing the new features but also the uh, user contributed talks like the lightning talks and some of the more extended talks um i know i was blown away by a lot of that of what other people are doing uh what were some of the cool parts that that you saw in those kind of user contributions that really kind of took you back and be like yeah this is really working yeah uh it, it'd be hard for me uh, to choose a favorite and and a lot of these things i i've you know i've been very familiar with over the years that uh, you know vincent i've known since since day one of him um working on on radiant uh and, and obviously radiant i think is is it's monumental right <laughs> it's crazy oh, yeah. that i've was... been emu- trying to emulate it to this day and i he, luckily talking to him a lot of things made sense after that but it's an excellent showcase yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it, it's it's crazy um uh but you know i i think everyone just re- really did such a nice job um not only in in what they were able to build but uh in how well they prepared for the talks um i i, I think it was particularly cool to see some of the ones from um like Friss and Airbnb uh, and uh, and Genentech, in, in that we don't usually um, get to. I, I guess I get a lot of questions and a lot of uh, emails from the Shiny Discuss list from people who are doing their work out in the open. Um, but for people who are working on apps that stay inside companies, um, it's often harder, or, or they need to be very cagey about what they share with us. So it was cool that those companies were willing to. Uh, you know, open their doors a little bit and and let us get a peek at, at some of the stuff that they've done. Um, and and it's really uh, pretty cool how how much use uh, you know those companies have been making uh, with Shiny and um, or of Shiny and and uh, how how far they were able to push things. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just well, I'm in some a similar situation here, but I will say that I've been making shiny apps that have contributed to some very important like design choices or or decisions to be made but if i had had to resort to like a a huge powerpoint deck of like all these different graphs that nobody could really understand just on that that format but then i it was a pretty simple app that kind of gave me the the most uh you know traction with it was just a simple sidebar app with just a few different drop downs but it just got everybody talking and 
making these key decisions. So um, I know we're hoping to, to share some of that in the open uh, in the near future, but there's, it's been very helpful for us too. Um, so I think I'll, I'll also ask about, obviously the timing of this conference is when a lot of new features have come into Shiny. Um, to me, one of the biggest ones that I'm using immediately is the concept of modules. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the background on how modules came about. Sure. Uh, so modules, um, they're really something that I've resisted for a long time. Uh, we got questions, um, I guess not quite from the very beginning, but maybe a year into Shiny's existence, we started getting questions about um, how do I organize my code? How do I take a complex app and break it into pieces. Oh, actually, uh, Vincent, I think, maybe um, brought it up right away. <laughs> with, oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I think, was was maybe an outlier in terms of how early he saw the need for it. Sure. Uh, and he, he came up with his own solution, uh, like he did for a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people would ask me that. And, and you know, I would say, I, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Everything in Shiny can be managed with functions. So... You know, you can call functions from your server uh, function. You can um, make functions that return UI. You know, what's the problem, people? You know, <laughs> just right, right. the function is the unit of reuse in R. Uh, so it's the unit of reuse in Shiny as well. Um, and uh, what I was really overlooking was that even if you use functions to uh, you know, either interact with the server side and do reactive stuff or um, to generate stuff on the client, the inputs and outputs and their IDs, they form a flat namespace that you can't escape. So there's like a global namespace that all the IDs of uh, input and output widgets, um, they all need to be unique within that namespace. Right. A lot so, of us found this out the hard way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at first I was still pretty stubborn about it, I said, uh, yeah, that's fine. Just pass in an ID into your functions and use that to prefix all of your, um, all of your sub IDs, I guess. And uh, while that technically worked, um, I think there were two really big problems with that. Uh, number one, the syntax now for interacting with these inputs and outputs was just really gross. Uh, like, so instead of saying output dollar sign foo, you'd have to say output double um, square bracket, paste zero, ID, you know, comma, dash, foo. It's yeah, this just, is bringing back some poor yeah, memories, yes. It's <laughs> really bad. And and until I kind of did it a few times, I didn't quite, it, I didn't quite internalize how bad it was. Uh, you know, in most other languages, concatenating string is just plus, right? Uh, so, sure. but, but it's really bad when you, when you have to paste these things together. Um, and the other thing was that even if that was an acceptable solution, um, it's still, uh, it's not enough that it's possible, right? Um, too many users out there, they'll never ever put together that, oh, I just need to use functions and I need to you know, take these IDs and prepend them. There, there are just a lot of leaps of logic you have to make. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the last year is that it's not about what we make possible, it's about what we make accessible. And I don't just mean technically, I also mean in terms of like marketing these features. So I'll give you an example, Shiny, uh, Shiny Gadgets, this has been possible for about two and a half years now, at least, if not longer. Really? Um, I'm, I'm surprised, wow. Yeah, so the, uh, the Bioconductor guys um, had asked for the addition of the stop app function um, because they wanted to build interactive tools that they could use straight from R. So they've actually been using gadgets for years now. And I've been, you know, I, I, I've documented the stop app feature. I've told people both in person and in conferences, you can use stop app to return values. And therefore you can, uh, you know, build, build tools that, that do stuff. And everybody's like, oh, okay. And then nobody does it except for the bioconductor <laughs> guys, um, or almost nobody. And, um, it really wasn't until uh, this past fall uh, I, I had to give a talk at a uh, oral conference uh, in uh, in London, uh, London held by Mango Solutions, and I was thinking about what to talk about, and I and I said to myself, you know what, the the whole notion of being able to build tools using Shiny, not just apps, like why hasn't that taken off? And I and I think the problem was because that concept did not have a name, 
And just that lack of a name for your brain to hold on to and say, I'm building one of these things. Um, I think that just made it really too abstract for people to get their heads around. Um, I see. So just by naming that, just by saying Shiny now supports this new thing called gadgets. Oh, what's a gadget? Let me go learn about a gadget. Whereas before I'd say, okay, you've written a Shiny app. Now add Stop app and you've got a tool. And it's just like, uh, what? Oh, I don't, that's not what I'm building. I'm building an app, you know? So, um, <laughs> so modules, I think, is another one of those things where there's nothing in module or there's not that much in modules that, that you know, anybody couldn't do themselves. Uh, but it really gives us an opportunity to put a name on it, to put some functions around it uh, to kind of solidify it as a real thing. Um, that, and, oh, you know what? That was the other thing is that um, other people were saying, um, you know, I figured out a way to, to you know, have, have my own module system, but it would be really nice if it could work for real. You know, as if sure. any mechanism mm-hmm. that they came up with was not quote unquote real, right? Like <laughs> if it wasn't blessed by me or didn't come with a function that was part of the shiny namespace, it didn't count. Um, so people were really reluctant to call the source, uh, the source function from within their shiny server functions. They were really re- reluctant to, to come up with any kind of system of their own. Um, I see. So fine. You know, if, if people need that, then great. But a funny thing um, happened uh, like along the way, when we finally decided, okay, let's let's take modules seriously. Let's build this. There's clearly a need. Um, I got asked about it so many times um, at that conference in the fall that uh, Mango uh, had held, uh, and and a funny thing happened in that I realized that it's not just about uh, creating these things and parking your code in them, but they really need to to talk to each other, right? Right. Um, like, what good is a module if if you can't put values into it and get values out of them. And sure, sure. Uh, that turned out to be, um, I, I, we talked about this at the conference, you need to do that with reactive expressions. And that turned out to be both more elegant than I ever could have imagined, but also harder to convey. You know, it turns out that it's actually quite, quite a subtle concept for people to get. And I don't think that we fully succeeded at the conference for most people. Um, so that's all the more reason for us to have this be an official feature that everybody can kind of rally around and, and we can really educate people on the right way to build them, the right way to connect them, the right way to deploy them. Um, so I'm really glad now that, that I kind of overcame my stubbornness and, uh, and finally embraced modules. Yeah. Well, I think, um, like I said, of all the features that have come new, that's the one that I'm putting in practice right now because like what say Vincent's done, I was putting together a cobbled solution that was trying to do a similar thing. But yeah, I was I was hitting the namespace problems or session problems. But this it it I think once you understand the concept, like you said, how portable and how important reactivity expressions are or reactive expressions are that is really a powerful mechanism. But I think for the community, it's just gonna take some practice really diving into this and showcasing some of these examples. And obviously there have been some early adopters that have put their code out there already. So I think we're all kind of learning together how to, how to put this back in. But that was one of the features that obviously got my, my attention during the conference. And um, some other things that really um, were interesting were the concept of debugging your app where I've, mm. I've done things like the brow, putting the browser function inside like part of the server function and just kind of trace through me. But there were some real nuggets in, jo- in Jonathan's talk that I was like, I did not know that before. And, and none of this was particularly brand new with the exception of stack traces, which thank goodness you put that in. Because <laughs> I cannot tell you how many hours I've been trying to be like, which part of my server did that happen? Was it in this file? Man, that, oh, that yes. was painful. So yes, stack traces, bad. thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but lots of little nuggets there that I was frantically taking notes that just, I think having this venue to share all this in a dedicated setting is probably the way to get the community all starting to kind of adopt it as a whole. So that, those are excellent points there. Um, yeah. So then um, I think other topics I was thinking about that, we're not quite addressed yet, and and specifically, may you want to get your thoughts on it? Are, you know, there's there's still kind of an art in terms of how you design your apps in terms of like where you put certain UI elements or things like that, where 
in if you're a traditional web developer you've had an understanding of how to do those things but for an ordinary r user we're now trying to think okay what where should we put these inputs or what's the best way to logically lay them out um, do you have any tips for how you know users of shiny that don't have as much of a web development background can can figure out how to best design their apps from a ui perspective or um, anything like that um, I have to admit, I mean, even though I've been building UIs for many years, um, it's not, I feel like I can, I can speak to you about coding and I can tell you all about coding best practices and things like that. But, um, with, with building UI, I feel like I'm, my expertise, my expertise is not deep enough that I can actually articulate any, <laughs> any principles, you know, okay. like, so I, I, I understand them well enough to build passable UIs, but not enough to, to, to teach <laughs> other people. But sure. I, I will say that one, um, one, one thing that has, uh, kind of resonated with me, uh, is a comment I heard a few years ago that, um, what we, ascribe to good design when it comes to software UIs, 90% of it comes down to familiarity. Uh, or, or sorry, when we say that, that something is intuitive and easy to use, what 90% of what we mean, whether we realize it or not, is that it's familiar to us. Um, so I'd say to lean into that, uh, not to um, aspire to make novel or original UI metaphors, um, but usually the, the kind of obvious one that maybe is, an, is even a little bit boring is the one that that is going to be easiest for your users to get their heads around. Um, sure. So I think that is the main thing. And then the other thing, uh, and, and I, I'm not going to articulate this well, but um, I feel like uh, your application has to have a mental model that your uh, user can access, or I should say users should be able to, to form a mental model about your software. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's not enough that that everything be possible. It, it has to be, you know, that they, that they expect that what they expect to happen happens. So for example, if you have like five sliders and four of them, uh, wait for you to click update before updating. And then the fifth one doesn't, you know, it, it immediately applies its change. That's breaking the user's mental model of what that update button does. Even oh, if, right. yeah. even if in reactive, you know, in, uh, shiniest reactivity, you can do stuff like that. Um, it doesn't mean it's a good idea if it subverts the user's mental model of, of how something works. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really important to, um, to, to try to put yourself in the user's shoes and, and ask whether something would be understandable um, when something happens. So, Right. It almost seems like as you're, if you're developing a pretty complex app that early on, you almost do like a version of, of user acceptance testing or something like that, where you get a group of people and be like, hey, do you expect this to happen or this to happen? And then you kind of kind of iterate along that way. But I think for a lot of us, we're kind of picking up those skills along the way. But I, like you, I know I, I'm not a designer in terms of what's the best way to lay this stuff out, but I just try to make it functional so that they expect something to see, they'll see it. And if there's something not obvious that now I'm heavily taking advantage of uh, Dean Atelli's uh, Shiny JS package to kind of walk them through certain messages or hiding certain things or disabling certain things until they do an action so that it's more clear to them. Don't go to that tab until you click this button first right, or right. things like that. So yeah. lots of lots of ways. I think that there's kind of an art to tying all that together. But I think other than practice, or, or practice is really the only thing that can enhance those skills a bit. Um, sure. Yeah. So I, one other thing that admittedly I was kind of hoping would be touched on, which who knows, maybe you guys have a solution for this in the future. Um, it's pretty established how we go about automated testing in terms of like package development. Obviously, with Hadley's test that framework, it's it's stupidly easy now to do it for a package. But in terms of testing a shiny app, especially in terms of like the UI elements doing what you expect them to do, um, I've seen some attempts at this. Um, in particular, a package called. Um, R Selenium. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So he, so the author has some examples of how you can test a shiny app. Now that it's kind of, it's got some dependencies. That's not really my biggest pain point. It's more about if you have a complex application, remembering what you called certain inputs and how you, how you go about scripting all that. 
I don't know if you had any advice on terms of testing shiny apps kind of directly or if that's something you guys are looking at in the future. Uh, yeah, that is that is definitely a pain point right now. Um, I think that it's challenging in any language or any framework uh, to do uh, kind of from the user's perspective, um, that kind of automated testing. Um, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with Selenium uh, from other languages. I, I have not used, um, or at least I, I, I can't remember if I've used the R version. Um, but as far as I know, that is probably your best bet in terms of the end-to-end -end testing. Um, okay. We do um, recommend that you do uh, as much of your business logic, I guess, I mean, business in quotes, your, your non-shiny specific logic in fu uh, functions that can be separately tested. Um, so you can sort of unit test at the function level, and then hopefully your server, uh, your shiny server function will primarily be about wiring those kind of already tested functions together, um, which is not a substitute, but, um, but you know, it should help. Uh, and then the other thing is that we, we have talked in the past, we've still not done this, but we've talked about having a mode that shiny runs in where instead of calling run app, you give it a list of input values um, and say, uh, you know, calculate app or something. And it goes and it runs all the observers and it runs all the outputs and it gives you back a list of outputs. And then you can just verify that, you know, the tables and plots and whatever that you were expecting have not changed. Um, that's not going to work for every application. Some applications, especially if you use render UI to create inputs or something like that, <laughs> right. um, are just not going to be covered in that kind of a world. You still need R Selenium, but you know, it kind of, it kind of is what it is. Um, the, 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 the other thing that we could try is to, to run some kind of, um, you know, headless browser. So, uh, so we would run our Selenium for you or something like phantom JS or, or what have you. Um, right. And then, you know, do some kind of snapshot of the HTML and just make sure that the HTML is what you expect it to be. So it's all stuff that we've talked about, but, um, have not quite risen to the top of our, of our feature list. So. Right. Yeah, the Phantom JS framework is intriguing. I actually worked with our internal IT group to get that installed in our system so that I could at least try this testing framework out. So I think, um, yeah, as, as we go along, we'll hopefully uh, get some get some more uh, best practices. But I think the point you did make, it resonates with me that all of what I'll consider the back end processing that, like you said, is not shiny specific. I've had some apps where it's basically that part is basically in another package that we developed internally. So as long as that package author does some automated testing, then we know that, hey, this function has been, you know, quote unquote validated the work because of our automated tests. It's more about just making sure we're calling it the right way and things like that. So well, I'll definitely uh, keep my eyes on that going forward. Um, and then um, one other thing that was a nice theme in terms of, especially from the users that were contributing talks, I think the whole HTML widget ecosystem has really kind of exploded in terms of the innovations that we're seeing and what they put inside their shiny apps. Um, what What's your take on where HTML widgets are going and how that's going to help uh, propel shiny development in the future? Uh, yeah, so um, it's getting complicated, frankly. Uh, I think we, when we created the first version of HTML widgets, it was very obvious. Uh, we had a very obvious, um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, we had a very obvious goal in mind, uh, and that was to take JavaScript libraries that represent outputs and uh, and Im embed them, build them in such a way that they could be embedded in our Markdown documents, in Shiny apps, and from the console all with just writing the JavaScript bindings once. And, you know, that was a simple charter. It was, um, you know, I won't say it was easy. There were definitely um, difficult things that we had to build into it in order to make that possible, especially um, to get it to work well uh, in all those scenarios. But at least the semantics were very clear um, about what we were trying to do. And in the time since then, um, what we've been working on um, is trying to extend that model of using R to generate JavaScript and HTML and CSS uh, automatically to encompass more than just outputs. Um, this, is, this is quite a big topic. I'll see if I can boil it down. Um, there are two main scenarios that we uh, target with HTML widgets going forward. Um, 
one is the um I'll say the Ramnaths of the world, right? Where <laughs> they're very conversant in R, they're very conversant in JavaScript. And HTML widgets is really like a convenience for him. Uh, it, it's a very convenient way for him to take data in R, do computations on it, and then put it together uh, to, to compose JavaScript-based single-page applications that don't have any backend. And I say it's a convenience for him in that uh, what I mean by that is there's nothing that HTML widgets is doing that he could not himself do because he knows JavaScript. Um, okay. But it makes it very, very convenient. Um, so what we're uh, letting people like him do is to, um, I think one of the main things that, that's been missing for people like him is with HTML widgets today, you can create the widgets really easily. But then if you want to write additional kind of customizations or whatever in JavaScript, especially if you want to tie together multiple um, multiple uh, widgets, um, like have have actions in one widget affect actions in another. Uh, that, that's been something that has not we have not made easy at all. And if you if there's a solution at all, it's implemented on a per widget basis. So mm -hmm. um, quite recently, uh, maybe a month or two ago, um, I, I submitted a PR that lets you annotate arbitrary HTML, just, just pipe it into any widget. And when that widget executes um, or is rendered, that HTML, that JavaScript that you wrote will be inlined into its render function. Uh, so uh, that's not going to mean anything to you unless you're an expert with HTML widgets already. But if I, if I had example code in front of you, you could see that uh, basically anything that you can do using a widget's JavaScript API, you can now do when you create the widget from R, you can just add a string of what additional thing you want to do to it, including bind it to another widget. So uh, people like Ramnath uh, now have the ability to kind of go hog, hog wild if they want to. Um, let me see if I, let me just yeah. find the name of that function for you. So um, Sure, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll put uh, it in the show notes, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look it up and then, and then I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, on static render complete, I believe. Oh, okay. Okay, it's something like that. I'll have to, to look that up then, yeah. Um, and there, there should be some examples uh, if you Google around for it. Uh, so, th so that's one set of scenarios is for people like him, uh, making it possible to write additional customizations in JavaScript and, and kind of making blowing, blowing out the possibilities to anything you can cover in JavaScript. Now, that being said, that's, th that doesn't describe the average R user, right? Most R users don't also know JavaScript. Uh, so one thing that we've also been pushing on is trying to let you take multiple widgets, drop them in the same page, and as long as they all uh, fulfill a previously agreed upon contract, then they will automatically start working together. Uh, so you could drop uh, you know, a scatter plot in, and then an, a time series. Uh, maybe time series is not a good example. Let's say a scatter plot and like a leaflet map. And when you make a selection, uh, like, you know, create a brush over the scatter plot, then whatever points you've selected in the scatter plot will also light up in leaflet and vice versa. Um, so, uh, so link brushing, basically. Um, and what we envisioned was a way to um, basically just put enough communication uh, mechanisms in place uh, for HTML widgets generically that this could just happen, like this would just automatically start working. Um, and that work is so experimental that we actually have implemented it in a separate package called Crosstalk. Oh, I was going to ask about this because I think I saw uh, Kent Russell from T the Tommy Portfolio, um, the user, he commented on this in an issue, right? Yeah, so so cross, yeah, there's a there's an issue that, that I, it must be 50 messages deep at least at this point that is all about this stuff uh, and, and, and where that was where crosstalk was kind of born out of. Um, and uh, and uh, the plotly uh, guys have have done some work to support it to support crosstalk, uh, Carson Sievert in particular. Uh, and uh, Ryan Hafen is now doing um, some work on our bouquet to um, to have bouquet support this as well. Um, now, if if it turns out that this idea has legs, if it turns out that, yes, we can usefully do this, not just for those two 
you know, really big toolkits, but but uh, it, it gets embraced in general by the HTML widgets community. Uh, then those changes would probably be merged into HTML widgets itself, and HTML widgets would just have this crosstalk mechanism as a feature. Um, that said, uh, it's very speculative. I, I really, when we dreamed up these ideas last October or whatever, I kind of thought it'd be a slam dunk. But the the further we get into it, the more I kind of feel like that nah, this could this could go either way. <laughs> it's, <laughs> right. It's a little yeah. early to tell, but it sounds like there's a lot of things under the hood that need to happen correctly to, to make this seamless then. Yeah. A, a lot of people want this to happen. A lot of people are really excited about this. I mean, I think that's the reason why the thread um, on on this topic got so big in the HTML widgets issue repo. Um, so yeah, I think that enthusiasm may carry us over the finish line, um, but it is, it is um, it's different than shiny in that, it's it's uh, there's just trade-offs everywhere, and there's no solution that that doesn't have problems. So we just have to pick which set of problems we want to live with. Um, right, right. Um, I should add one more thing uh, in HTML widgets land um, is that Ramnath is working on uh, adding reactivity to HTML widgets itself. So wow. um, the the kind of client the kind of server side reactivity you get with Shiny, he's trying to duplicate on uh, the front end with uh, inspired by some JavaScript reactivity libraries. And uh, he's hoping to have, you know, pretty similar semantics to what you do in Shiny. So you'd have, um, you know, reactive expressions or their equivalent observers or their equivalent. You'd have observable inputs and things like that. Um, And at the end of the day, what he's hoping you can do is you can tie um, HTML widgets that represent inputs, not just outputs now, but have input widgets um, and then uh, have them connect together with output widgets in pretty straightforward ways. And uh, and if you want to do additional calculations to you know transform that data, kind of like a reactive expressions, uh, you can express that in JavaScript um, by kind of including it in your in your R commands. So you you'd make two widgets and then add, a, uh, you know, the equivalent of a reactive expression and it'd be a string and then you put some JavaScript in there um, and drop all that into some kind of a template and they would all render on the page and then you'd have this interactive, uh, you know, sort of things. And um, I think where that leaves you is now you have HTML widgets, which, um, you know, when you use them standalone, they are really nice in that they don't require any server infrastructure uh, and you can use them anywhere. And... um, you get really responsive uh, interactivity, uh, and you can combine that with Shiny, which is necessary when you want to do any kind of recomputation at runtime in R. So if you want to, you know, fit models or do predictions or, uh, you know, access large data sources, um, all those things would still require Shiny, and then you can also use them together. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, well, so that. Yeah. That sounds really intriguing. I'll, I'll kind, of, kind of see where the dust settles on that. But I've been using multiple widgets in my apps, <clears throat> like some like our hands on table or diagram R or things like that. If there's just ways to make those talk to each other seamlessly, oh my goodness, that's that's gonna that's gonna be huge. I think so. That I guess I'm one of those people that's enthusiastic about where this goes down the road. But not a trivial problem to solve by any means. <laughs> Um, so I, well, I think we'll, I'll kind of wrap up with now that you've had a few days to hopefully decompress a bit after the conference, I'm um, going forward for the next time you offer this, which I'm assuming might be next year. Um, what are some of the key takeaways you got from this iteration that will help you kind of plan or, or, or um, structure the conference going forward in the future? Yeah, um, I was surprised by how much positive feedback there was. Uh, well, first of all, there were positive feedbacks about all the talks. I don't want to um, give the impression, uh, give the wrong impression. Uh, every every single one of the talks was uh, very well received. Uh, but in particular, people seemed very hungry for the, the tutorials and um, said they could have done with even more tutorials. Uh, so that, that that was a surprise to me. Um, and uh, And I think we would probably lean into that a little bit more next time then. Uh, and uh, and the other thing is, I think this is probably, I'm just going to guess that this is the last time we do a single track conference. Um, okay. It just seems like there's, we could have done so much more. We could have done more user talks. We could have done like a lot of other things, um, but we had to cut a lot of stuff for time. So 
Um, I think it's likely that in the future we do a multi-track conference. Um, th- honestly, it's not my favorite. Like I really, I really enjoy single-track conferences, um, but I think just in the interest of of getting the right content in there, and and you know, still keeping it to a couple of days, uh, we'll we'll probably go mul- uh, multi-track next time. That's cool. I know for a lot of us um, that I talked to over there, it was our first ever like attendance of any R related conference. So it's a little bit of an anomaly that, you know, obviously use R is obviously multi-track and things like that. But if this is the last time you guys do a single track, then I'm really fortunate that I could see it. Um, But hopefully going forward, it will be easy to strike the balance between you know like you said the users that want to know more about how things work hence the tutorials but i also get just as much enjoyment out of just seeing the showcase of whatever people are doing that gives us enough inspiration to say okay i want to emulate parts from what he did or what she did and and kind of tie it all together so yeah two days it was jam-packed but obviously a lot of us probably wanted it like a day longer just to dive into more things but uh, hopefully going forward it's easy for you guys to, to find a, a good way to organize that going forward so yeah um so yeah joe i think this has been a really um enlightening conversation to hear more of your perspective on, on all things shiny and your background before that so i just want to thank you very much for uh, joining me today and hope you um have a great rest rest of the day and good luck with the new features and shiny in our studio going forward great thanks eric All right, everyone, we'll be right back after this. Okay, I hope you really enjoyed hearing those conversations. I know I was just so excited to be able to talk with them about these topics and just being able to meet them, you know, put faces with all the the commit messages and all the package news and all everything going on in terms of their development of our studio. It's just really good to kind of sit down with them face to face and and get their perspectives on it. And I will admit kind of my, uh, this was a little geeky of me, but I wasn't the only one that did this. I did bring my um, copy of the uh, advanced R book that Hadley wrote and I got his autograph. I just couldn't resist. And even I even got the autograph of another uh, member that I didn't have a chance to interview directly, but uh, Winston Chang also signed my um, R graphics cookbook, which was a real thrill for me because I've been using his book for ggplot for who knows how many, it's been at least a couple years now. And I always tell people that, if you're new to ggplot too, you got to check that book out. It just gets everything to the point, but he really walks through it practically. So anyway, it was kind of like, these are kind of like celebrities to me. So it was really cool to be able to talk to, to get those autographs. So hopefully I keep those in a safe place. Don't want uh, anything happening to them. <laughs> um, so I think um, what I'll, I'll say next is, I think overall in terms of the way the conference was run, I was really impressed with the way they got the material in and how they kind of paced things throughout. I mentioned even during the interviews with um, with the team that I thought, you know, they did an excellent job here. And I think their directions for the next time are definitely going to have more people and possibly multiple tracks. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, but then just some other things I'll mention is that I was able to hear about through the lightning talks and some of the extended talks, some really interesting uh, community efforts that are interacting with Shiny directly, either through add-on packages or through really nice applications. In fact, I'm actually going to use our next segment to talk about some of the stuff I discovered in our package pick. So one of the main themes of, of the developer conference in terms of the technical material was the concept of modules, which are kind of like, as you heard um, in the previous uh, interviews, those are really like the way you can encapsulate certain parts of your Shiny application as kind of their own inner, their own unit, as they say, 
and then be able to plug those in in multiple you know places in your application and not have to worry about the namespace issues or having multiple inputs be the same name that was always a headache for me when i was starting to build a a fairly complex application so modules have been a great way to kind of figure out how the best you know segment parts of your application and be able to kind of tidy those up independently but be able to use them in multiple ways so a lot of us are kind of getting to know this feature right now in our app development but i do have an example to share um, one of the presenters i believe in one of the lightning talks was a uh, ian little and he has created an R package called Shiny Pod. And while it, and frankly, this is the first package I've seen by someone in the community that basically follows the advice of the R Studio team in terms of making a package out of whatever modules you're developing. So Shiny Pod is has got basically two modules inside. It, you can upload and process a CSV file into a typical R data frame, as well as doing a pretty nice looking uh, die graph using two Y axes. But this was really the first time I seen somebody really try to package up a module. And I thought, okay, this is, this is a good reference for us to follow. So I'm developing modules in some of the applications I'm developing at work. So as I see certain parts of my app that I think others in in my team or outside of my team might be able to use then now i have kind of a good reference point for how you might tidy those up into a package format so we'll have a link to shiny pod in the show notes in case you're interested in checking that out it is on github i don't believe it's on cran yet but again it's fairly new so perhaps down the road they'll be releasing it on cran in the future um so I think with that, we're going to kind of wrap up this episode. I will mention that I've heard from a couple um, possible future interviewees that I'm going to be in, in talk with and hopefully um, get them on the show to get their perspectives on things with R, maybe with Shiny as well. And then I'll just mention again that the best way you can, uh, you can actually have multiple ways of contacting me in terms of feedback. Um, first, each episode will have its own kind of comment trail that you can leave a comment on via the typical discuss uh, framework. You can also head to our contact page. And of course, the website for the podcast is r-podcast.org. You can click the contact link at the top and then just send me a quick message. If you have topic suggestions or or um, you know feedback on the episodes or whatever have you just please pass it along my way um, I did hear some people really excited about the past couple of interviews so I think in future episodes I'm definitely gonna try and get others in the community you know to talk with me even if it's not very long just to kind of share their perspective on what they're up to and where they think R is headed in the future um, so again, thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, multi-part series on Shiny, and in particular the Shiny Developer Conference. I know I'm excited to see where Shiny is going from here, and be able to use some of these new features that some of which have been here already for a while, and some are brand new. But just being able to use this knowledge and apply it to make my um, applications better, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we'll see by the time I release this if they've released the, um, the actual videos of the presentations. And if they have, I'll put it in the show notes. Other than that, I'll just also link to other resources that were mentioned, including um, the new version of our studio that was released that has a lot of the, some of the features that we talked about in these discussions. So that's going to put a wrap on episode 18. Until next time. End of line.